and namaste everyone it's such a privilege for all of us uh, to be sitting together on this auspicious day of shivendu's mahasamadhi din uh this time we would just like to go start the program but before govind ji do you want to say something I, I'm fine. We start with that. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm-hmm. Are you saying something, Govindji? Oh, no, I, I think I said we will we'll start. We'll start with the okay. Old, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Alok ji, please. Namaste. There are two gospels with regard to death, and they have been known since ancient times, given different names. from you know the stories of early stories of uh, efforts at immortality right down to our modern days but for the sake of convenience i like to pick up names from indian puranic legend and i call them to avoid controversies as to who can claim which gospel one is the gospel of hiranyakashipu and the second is the gospel of prahlad and we know this is a very ancient puranic legend i won't go into its details but essentially hiranyakashipu's gospel is as is the gospel of almost all the asuras that this world is nothing but matter and its origin is desire and its goal is enjoyment and pleasure and comfort this is the gospel of hiranyakashipu in very brief nutshell so because it believes that body is all and material reality is the sole reality therefore it tries all ways and means material ways and means to prolong this reality as long as you wish to or as long as you can this is one gospel which i said is got a gospel of harinikashipu so it tries to master all the possible causes of diseases you know that is what harinikashipu's boon is that i may not die he has laid down all kinds of conditions of death he thinks uh, if he can eliminate them he will not die neither morning nor night nor inside nor outside nor weapons nor shastra or astra not gods or demons not human beings nor this being so he neither of disease neither of so all all kinds of various means he masters uh, the essence of the story is that but as we know the story goes death finds a way it creates a being i mean i'm not going into the religious aspect of it but a being is born who kills him despite all the conditions because death has its ways and means to enter it can always create uh, you know ways and means through which we leave the body and there is a reason and purpose behind it now on the other hand there is another gospel prahlad's gospel it believes in the fundamental immortality it is a very strange paradox so harinikashipu's gospel seems uh, at least plausible that if we control all the material conditions we are you know we can probably become immortal but prahlad's gospel is very simple it says basically in our deep essence we are immortal and this gospel finds very interestingly uh a validation within our own intuition so while we are all told that you know we are going to die whoever is born is going to die even spiritual leaders say that you know ultimately it's all nothing and it's all an illusion you are going to die one day now even they are busy both earning money finding ways and means to have a happy life uh, why because uh, there is within us a will to live and a joy to live which is a very one of the strangest paradoxes of human life in ancient times in the mahabharata the parable of yudhishthir and the yaksha prashna 
it comes out very forcefully that you know we see death every day but something in us is not convinced of the reality of death so the he puts it like this that ki masharyam what is the most surprising thing it is very surprising but its answer is very simple because deep within intuitively we carry the sense of a secret immortality so these are the two main gospels and they try to some there are ages of mankind when the first gospel takes prominence like today we have the harinikashup gospel that everything has to be done externally by material means there is no other means or no other existence and the other one in the spiritual ages of mankind where, and it has always been there in all ages but in the more spiritual ages of mankind that we have a immortal self within us and it's possible to discover it and when we discover it we discover that we are immortal and we are transiting from one form to another from one form to another through a cycle of death and birth so these are the two main gospels how are we going to validate it one is scientifically we try to find every possible means to finish off every organism every genetic error every molecular aberration and even organ transplant we can try it science has taken that means the result is that average life span today is about 80 years that's about it and even with the best researches in the best hospital we are we are not able to prevent the most natural cause of death which is aging and as long as we don't have the secret to aging any amount of outer manipulation we are going to progressively you know enter into a state of death Phys i'm talking right now on about physical death whereas the other thing also can be validated if we take the trouble of discovering whether there is really a soul within us or not and all who have gone in that direction have discovered and said yes there is an immortal self within us and these people cutting across all party lines cutting across all nations gender education everything have arrived at the same discovery which is something fascinating that after all um, you know how is it that right down the generations there is something like that to be discovered which path we'll take is left to each one of us but to understand death this much we can say with certainty that existence cannot be just limited to our waking uh, state when we are dealing with the body with our eyes open and what we call as apparently call as conscious whereas actually this consciousness is uh, you know there is a whole range of which we are not aware of which we are unconscious oh, yeah, I, I and this other consciousness I you know awakens in a dream state and during the dream state we are another existence we are the same person strange that existent doesn't finish even when the body is asleep there are dream worlds open and to a mystic of course uh, many other worlds but dream worlds open when we operate where we do things and we are completely identified with that self and when we wake up sometimes it can be pretty confusing there are states in which we get confused what was real was it real which we just experienced or is this real to which we have woken up so meaning thereby existence is not confined to this mode of living which we call as today which we identified as living uh, existence continues and all that happens during the phenomena of physical death because no other death exists is simply that existence changes its mode just like in dream ex state we experience existence differently and there is a reason for it right now we experience existence through our senses and our physical mind but when these are not functioning after death when these senses drop off the physical mind is left behind then we experience existence from the vital energy vital sheath that's how the upanishad speaks about there are several sheaths through which we transit and in during the transit existence changes this mode we enter into vital worlds thought worlds worlds of uh, you know desire worlds of feelings and in each of these worlds there are heavens and hell through which one transits and finally there is the pure spiritual world so one thing we must understand that death is a unreal reality in the sense there is something called as death which we experience uh, and that is when to the all sensory evidence which is a very poor evidence to say the least suddenly we see a body which is no more breathing which is no more Uh, the heart is no more be beating and the brain has become dead so we call it death what we forget is that this is simply death of the body 
and by that we mean that the body has stopped functioning in its normal mode and when it doesn't function in, in its normal mode even then the body doesn't die it disintegrates and its elements merge with the universal nature so that's one aspect of it but what happens to the existence it's not lost it continues to be experienced by someone or something within us call it soul or whatever that's not so important but there is something which continues to experience existence in different ways and modes and there are any number of examples stories personally i have collected even written in this uh, you know um, uh, the book my book uh, death dying and beyond plenty of stories and real authentic so i am not going into that detail because it's a vast subject but nevertheless existence doesn't cease with death of the body this is the first thing second is that we don't exist only at the bodily level frankly if we existed only at the bodily level this question and we were sure of it this question that is there a way of freedom of death would not arise the fact that this question arises within us time to time is because there is a possibility of discovering something immortal within us and this is not a new search elixir of immortality samudra manthan and countless stories scientific effort in ancient ayurveda there was a method of kayaka they were getting it right that if you can discover the secret of prolonging life of uh, healthy living of stopping aging in some way then probably you will find a key to conquest of death because that's where the whole crux lies so uh, they were approaching things in a very logical way and the logic of it is that after all our cells do die million times some of the cells die almost none of the cells is the same after say few years uh, time they are all changed so meaning thereby there is a series of miniature deaths and each of these deaths very interestingly becomes a bridge to enter into a new mode of living an adolescent is so different from the child but do we say that the child is dead no the child has evolved into an adolescent adolescent into an adult adult into a you know whatever is meant by so called mature individual and a mature individual um, i mean i may not much believe in it Uh, that you know mature individuals exist <laughs> but uh, <laughs> i mean the way it is defined mature individuals are the way geeta defines but that apart um grows into a wise old man apparently hopefully because ball doesn't make one uh, wise it can make one beautiful though so this is how we undergo a series of transmutations of death in our one lifetime we can see that the body is not the same sometimes it undergoes so much radical change that is difficult to even imagine that i was this child even the texture of the skin begins to change everything changes and yet we there is a continuity of life so when we call it as death is when actually there is a snapping off now that's where comes the question snapping off of what after all the body could continue like this going into a more and more uh, you know different kinds of states Uh, the reason secret reason for it is twofold one is of course which is very evident the imperfection of matter matter cannot progress beyond a limit it is quite rigid so it receives the impact of world forces a little baby starts receiving these impacts and these impacts it has to process inside the brain the body everything processes it and then it acts upon the world and in this process over a period of time a disequilibrium or a disharmony begins to take place between uh, uh, one body and the body of this world and in this process as disharmony and disequilibrium continues to progress possibilities of disease has begin to arise it's a dynamic equilibrium as we all know it is every moment to moment with that we don't realize it is a different thing altogether that speaks volumes about the way body has been built and this equilibrium and adaptation and evolution is at several levels and that level is not just physical psychological impact social impacts now we all know that stresses can lead to an early uh, you know aging and um, it can lead to you know Uh, diseases it is one of the number one killers so the impacts that the body takes is not just physical but psychological social and i would add spiritual because these forces are there also in the environment so essentially the first thing we have to discover is that how to create an equilibrium within us and outside us so this equilibrium while it is easy to have at the level of the mind and the vital and heart to an extent but it's very difficult at the level of the body because the body is not able to follow 
the movement of progression of the other two parts take for example our soul or let let leave aside the soul for a moment the mind the mind wants to soar into higher regions of consciousness it wants to study and it wants to discover wonderful things or simply learn new things but what happens after a while the heart has its own demands so it begins to feel crushed life its longings they revolt and react paradoxically because these are also members of our own being and the body after a while begins to feel tired the brain begins to feel sleepy the eyes heavy and after a few days one begins to the the sleep backlog catches over so all these different part the inherent complexity of human being is another cause for death we are not unicellular organisms where death doesn't exist the more complex a person is the more difficult to create the balance and harmony so first we must find that center around which the balance can be created so we have you know center balance is literally by something through which you hang the two two sides so that that center Uh, there are two possible centers of human being one is the ego which keeps shifting from day to night and the other is the true psychological center center which is the soul within us so if we discover and start organizing our life around it and at least some workable harmony can be created within any and yet it is not going to give us freedom from physical death because the body is exposed in ones but at least we'll discover one level of immortality and that level is that we dis- uh, you know it's a wonderful discovery that uh, whether i live or die i am a bit paradoxically the body's life or death doesn't affect me it's the effect of a million animal cules of which the body is made the you know disintegrate the house consumes not i this uh, is a profound spiritual discovery and there are ways means but the first step is that well um, the faith that there is something like that exists so this is the reality through which we become free from death its impacts are tremendous impacts that we are no more scared of death we know it is literally a shedding of the robe so of course gita says profound truth but simply because it becomes a fact of our existence let's take an example kananda so i wake kananda you know when he left his body he came at night in the dream he didn't know about it and he tells him the disciples i have spat my body it's literally a language that well it has done its purpose and i have left second one realizes instrument of the soul and so the way we look after it changes completely is needed not because i have to you know survive personally indefinitely but because the instrument for the divine purpose and as long as the will within me uh, which is you know we are all certain will to manifest that is active it can serve that purpose wonderful and it cannot the central will decides to leave and it's okay it's like a worn out cloth we drop off and who would want to wear the same dress after all for centuries and centuries i mean um, it's it's too boring and the second third reason for death is finite soul wants to taste infinity because it's come from the infinite but it has to experience it entering into this material breath fastened cage so how does it experience It, the only way it can experience is by changing over of the body from one to another somebody you know that example which i often quote that you know there was a boy in the ashram setup he was supposed to be reincarnation of rani lakshmi bai's uh, horse so that horse had reincarnated and his, his walk and everything was almost you know equestrian and he once wrote a letter in his 30s or 40s mother i want to marry an american wife you know first birth so that's how one wants so after few births when one has really grown and matured then one says i want to be just born in india and whatever happens <laughs> let it be in india <laughs> but one of the first births he says i want to marry an american wife and the mother simply wrote by the side not in this life and after two days he was dead and gone so now this is the re- another reason for death because the soul within us must grow through thousand impacts it needs that and if it doesn't get it its growth potential is stifled not that it will leave the body it will be stifled it won't grow at a rapid pace so this is the second or third 
reason of death. So first is the imperfection of matter. It cannot follow the universal movement. It must be able to do that. The mother uses a very beautiful expression. She says, uh, you know, undoing the body, future words. Right now, the body is undone backwards. Several times we change, but the consciousness is advanced. Body is unable to keep pace. Let's take a very simple thing. People have this weird idea when you are 60, 70, 80, you are an old person. Don't say this to a person who is 70 or 80. Because in his heart, he's as young, as fresh, as sweet as 16. Trust me, I can tell you this, that you know this is a big, at 60, you are as young as 16. It's a different thing that life, you know, social uh, trappings and, you know, me mental concept. No, no, you're, you're, you're 60. You're reminded all the time. But your body cannot behave like 16. Because if you try to behave like 16 when you're 60, uh, the body will begin to break down because it's not capable of uh, giving that output. So the body is falling backward. Life is moving forward. It doesn't. I mean, I, there are cases like, you know, dementia and all where things go down. But otherwise, uh, even people have a second childhood. Uh, they they be, become like that. You know, their grandparents who are like child. You know, they play with the child, and so beautifully they gel with it. They are so understanding about many of these adolescents and youngsters that you know sometimes even parents are not because they've evolved and grown with the universal movement, but body cannot. And so it tends to after a while, if one has to grow. One has to change the body and one can see this cycle within a lifetime. From a child, you start, you grow and finally you become a child again, even the physical posture. And that's the time you're preparing for becoming a child again in the womb. See, sometimes these elderly people, I mean, um, uh, I have seen in the old age home, even the physical posture becomes like a baby. It's like, you know, they have already gone ahead in their consciousness as if they are sleeping in womb and awaiting to re-emerge. So looked at from this point of view, death doesn't exist. It's a constant change which is going on within us. The second thing is about immortality or you know freedom from death is when we are able to consciously dwell in domains towards which right now we are unconscious. So what do we call death? When we pass away from our sensory existence, we can't see. Now imagine if someone was conscious enough in the other domains. Really see those who are passing through these, transiting through other, other places. It's like, imagine somebody is taking a flight and there was a means, it's not a difficult thing at all, through a CCTV, somebody sitting on ground could communicate. So it's not, though the person has traveled and gone, yet there is a proximity and closeness. So right now we are not able to communicate with those who are departed because we are so heavily dependent on the senses to communicate. One of the good things that is happening through all messaging and all, I mean, there are a lot of issues about it. So let me not touch a controversial subject, but human would at some point of time become capable of directly messaging. They would know right now. We do not know whether the message has been delivered or not because we don't get a blue tick. But well, a time come when we would discover ways and means by which we would know yogis know when somebody leaves the physical sheath, goes into other sheaths, and we can uh, even accompany uh, allow that person to go through a safe transit. Everything is possible. So when we decide, and this is only possible when we discover the infinite consciousness, which will be present in all the different domains and depending upon where it wants to be by the mere presence, it can be in this or that domain that would be another freedom of death so this is the second level of freedom of death discover the immortal soul within the second is to discover the vast consciousness there is a third kind of freedom from death which the vedic rishis were trying and could discover that behind this physical body, there is a physical consciousness. And this physical consciousness is the original untouched blueprint. So whenever something goes wrong with the body, and to take steps into a certain way, it's, it has its blueprint inside. And this blueprint tries to impress itself and once again bring the body back to normal. And if we can awaken ourselves in this physical consciousness, it can be a tremendous help, not only in life, but even physically, even when the body is disintegrated, 
in the physical consciousness we can exist for a very very long time almost an indefinitely long time that is a kind of uh, immortality we speak about uh, with regard to ashwatthama and hanuman and sugriv uh, so usually uh, happens this kind of development happens only if one has done tremendous physical culture It's conscious of a body behind the body all people who engage in tremendous physical culture or even we can you know realize it if we take a, a vigorous workout so what happens after the workout there is something which is becomes very quiet and then when we sit we can experience as if there is another state of consciousness which is independent of the body something which is beautiful something which is crystal limpid clear peaceful quiet all this can be experienced even a bit of a joyous state and we can enter into that now this is one of the ways to heal also as uh, shurbindo said his formula for dealing with flu was not tammy flu but go inside in quietude call the mother's grace and when we go inside the body heals itself because it has the original blueprint that will impress itself upon the body and enter into a healing process so this is the third kind of immortality which one can enter into there is a fourth kind of uh, immortality freedom from death normally we think that freedom from death means uh, personality remains unchanged it's like prolongation of the personality even if the body dies the personality will remain the same if personality doesn't change and evolve it will lead to death much faster because the very purpose becomes counterproductive the absence of death or immortality is not prolongation of the personality it is rather the prolong the the only way that the personality can survive the onslaught of death is if it gets integrated around the secret psychic center the immortal soul so during a lifetime we have so many moments soul moments and if we have realized the soul then the the thoughts that we integrate around the soul the feelings that are emerging from the soul and integrated around it the life impulses urges which are turned in the direction of the soul and through the soul and the way is very simple even the physical movement that are turned towards the soul the way is very simple and the way is to offer everything into this fire of which is burning inside the soul into this flame now when we put things inside it it gets cleansed it gets refined it gets subtleized and at some point of time some elements get integrated so that's how when people in a certain uh, life have engaged their mind let us say in a certain soulful activity to take an example people say that shurbindo is very difficult we don't want to read it's so difficult to read him they don't realize if they read in this particular lifetime it gets integrated with the substance of the soul so when we come next time it becomes so easier you you have to just open the live divine and you'll feel it's a very familiar book you have read it even many of the things that you will communicate will be as if coming from there because it is got integrated in the soul as a kind of substance so whether we uh, you know can understand or not just read it it is going to get integrated so this uh, way we can integrate same with our feelings sometime people want to experience and live out true love it may not work out they may say that well even if you love someone truly the person doesn't return first of all if you are looking for return it's not no more true love but the very exercise the practice it helps the heart to grow in that sweetness and joy of true love so when we come next time we are already good with it because our heart feelings have been integrated with the soul so such a person when he comes actually loves from the soul has love not only for those who are his family members but in a much vaster scale for animals and everything because that's how the soul loves same with our life impulses so the it lies in trying to integrate these things around the soul or the psychic being and through that the psychic personality is put off and a point of time comes when this psychic personality not earthly personality as we know it certainly not doctor so and so certainly not the uh, visiting card that is all worn off and thrown preferably while we are living if we want to live long uh, but certainly after pacha this psychic personality can not only exist it can continue to act you know there are some beautiful stories in mother and shurbindo's time and they are there even in our puranas but this very these where amrit bhavani left the body left the body you see somebody went in the evening and saw him he was looking a little finished all his work of the day 
evening, eight o'clock, he was sitting quietly and somebody asked, Amrita, uh, how are you doing? And his usual nonchalant, uh, you know, way of saying everything is fine. Only my sweetheart is giving me some trouble. Now that evening starts and uh, not the same evening as yesterday, but he departed on one of the evenings, very days work, sitting quietly, and then he is departed. And what does the mother say? He came to mother and said, mother, to remain a little independently acting upon the earth. And I want to help all those are seekers. So he's allowed that. So there is an independence from all the wrappings, from all the, uh, you know, the action can be very widespread. That's how beings like uh, Swami Vivekananda, Swami Vivekananda had a visitation to Sri So there is a whole world waiting for a discovery. But the first necessity is we get dehypnotized from this that body is the only reality. If we believe that body is the only reality, then however my men try, like Haranyaka Shub tried, death will find a door. And if we can do all this, the final penalty made stage of immortalizing the physical body. It's only when these realize there is a psychic being, a psychic personality, it incarnates in a physical body and that it can begin to draw forces of a higher order and start integrating them with the physical substance. That's a very difficult part. It's not easy because, uh, you know, the human body shared the entire animal load. Matter has evolved under the most difficult conditions. So first of all, the body doesn't, the matter doesn't believe in grace. I mean, millions of years through which it has uh, you know, evolved. So one of the signs of the most material consciousness of human beings is that they begin to doubt in grace. They just really can't believe. Uh, not only in God, but even in grace. Why? Because material consciousness is developed like that. It has been hammered by blows. All those imprints are there within us. There is the animal within us. There are the atoms which have you know, shaped itself through billions of years of journey. So it takes a long time to decondition and reprogram them. And one of the elements of this deconditioning is to get rid of all these mental dogmas and ideas which we take from childhood. To start with, we have to start believing in the possibility of physical immortality. Certainly people would say it's a dream. Well, if it is a dream, let us dream it because it's a wonderful dream. And if we dream such dreams, one day we'll find a way to realize it. Now, the way to realize it is three-step procedure. One is to find way the means to keep away from diseases. That is the easiest way. And that is the way to learn how to adapt uh, to the challenges by creating harmony as soon as possible. It's not like disease won't occur, but you can bounce back because you have learned the law of harmony. You have learned to uh, open to the higher vibrations of harmony and order with which we can you know, introduce it into the disorder and set it right. In quietude, this one way. Second is the aging process. So aging process is, uh, as I said in Ayurveda, the process was kaya kalp. So people used to withdraw from all kinds of contact for 21 days or 42 days, go through an entire thorough lifestyle programming, uh, what is called today's detox. The body was, uh, you know, got rid of many of its, uh, you know, habitual sanskaras. And after those many days, the cells came out rejuvenated. My own feeling is it's not so, so much of the technical side of it. My own experience is that they came back rejuvenated because they had shut themselves off for some time from the continuous contact with the world, which was impinging and impacting. And the body is a machine. There is a limit to which it can take it, handle it. So if you want to live long, please, and live healthy, please try to find timeouts. And this idea that constantly one will be, well, there are beings who can do it. But it's good to give time out so that the body can learn to adapt. Sleep is given for that, by the way, to learn to adapt, assimilate, and then come back, you know, back into life. So, but prolonging life, as long as at least the work is to be done by the pressure of the will, by the pressure of faith, by the glowing faith, by aspiration, by turning the body uh, for the uses for which it is meant, not abusing it, not misusing it, is the way towards a uh, longer, healthier and harmonious life. And most important to not to take these suggestions of aging too seriously uh, because they are there in the atmosphere all around. So if we do it, 
they slowly, slowly, mankind will find a path through which the life in the body can be prolonged, really prolonged, not just, you know, um, provided medical science doesn't come in, just give that proviso, because one of, the, one of the healthiest ages of mankind were those when we were living by more natural means of fighting diseases than today. Today, we have the entire immune system and the body's innate, innate ability to rejuvenate. We have, thanks to, you know, uh, medical science. But if we go back to the healthier ages of mankind, I mean, if you just read the description of the battle between Arjun and Karna, it is imaginable and it's described in graphic detail. How many arrows pierced him and then, you know, he fought back, bounces back. One just wonders, you know, today if even a little thorn or a pin, you know, we'll say, I want a, you know, time off. And here is, here were warriors, Bhishmi at 170 and fighting a war. And Arjuna is 70 when he's fighting the war with such gusto. And that's because uh, there was a spontaneous vitality and this vitality exists. But today it's like very mentalized way of living and the mind has created all kinds of external ways. Actually, we are going down the slope of the Harinika Shub. So let's first discover our secret soul. Let's break through the limits and molds of the mind and enter into the domains of the infinite, cover that immortality. Let's engage in physical culture and a proper physical culture and a physical culture. Physical culture is, you know, a... a, a in a smith does a lot of physical culture. It doesn't lead to an awakening of the physical consciousness because it's done. Really. So if we consciously engage in physical culture, as the mother says, with this aspiration that may awaken to the light and this physical culture may be just taking a walk, then slowly, slowly these cells awaken and open up. And one of the signs will be that the body will be able to respond much faster to, you know, uh, calling in of the grace and even to spontaneously heal. So physical culture is one of the things which is very necessary. And of course, a regulated healthy lifestyle, which is a life of balance. And for the rest, we have to wait. Physical immortality will happen. It's the crown of the whole thing. But for that, the body has to be completely, the cells have to be completely unconditioned. Unconditioned from all the backload. They have to learn that there is no such law that there has to be disintegration and death. Salamanders, they grow up a new tail and, you know, new limb and, uh, you know, uh, trees, they can continue for 5,000 years. So there are ways and means within nature of uh, completely growing up new parts. Even there are experiments today um, that, you know, new limbs can be grown up through very physical means. But yes, it should be um, uh, you know, it makes sense only if consciousness is changed. If our consciousness is not changed and the body's life is prolonged, then it is uh, not a boon, it is going to be a bane like that of Ashwatthama. So let's work on all these levels uh, within us. But the first freedom that is easily accessible, which takes away the fear and the sting of death completely from us, is to discover the secret soul. That's what the mother said. It is the divinity within us. Discover it and integrate as far as possible the thoughts, feelings, life impulses, the movements of life, manifold activities, and the body around this secret psychic center. This was the way Indian culture had developed earlier, where from birth to death, from food till sleep and waking up, everything was integrated around the life of the soul. It was not just, uh, I mean, eating had to be offered, drinking water, wake up, first thing is to pray, uh, express gratitude night before we sleep we express gratitude we go to sleep uh, with either some mantra or some nice uh, images of the divine so this is the way we should lead our life so that slowly everything in us starts getting integrated around the soul then a time comes and yes as i said reading uh, mother and shurbindo which contains those sparks of the celestial fire so this is the way the body consciousness comes directly in contact with uh, that consciousness which is otherwise very difficult. Um, Mother says something very interesting about reading Shurabindu's books. She says, if you read Shurabindu's books, doesn't matter if you don't understand, the consciousness within the words will create new brain cells if necessary for the understanding. It's so wonderful. So meaning that by new brain cells can be created, which are open to the light. And brain is the seat of consciousness. The first thing which receives the light. 
so it's so wonderful such a direct way of engaging in physical yoga then she also uh, says something very beautifully to work for the divine is to pray with the body so the body is not at all engaged in the yoga and you know it's no point in talking about immortality unless the body is engaged in the yoga itself so the body should be engaged in the yoga it should be treated as a chariot meant for the divine uses and every day we must consecrate this body every aspect of the body this is a very beautiful prayer of pranab da which you know um, is so simple and so beautiful uh, ma be in my head and in my thoughts ma be in my eyes and in my sight be in my ears and in my hearing and it goes on right up to the foot so meaning thereby everything every part of a body should be used for the divine purposes and not for any egoistic purposes for expansion of desires and of course there are much much worse things of which you know it's best not told then another very interesting way of engaging the body in the yoga is simply to write say a passage from shurbindo from savitri to read it aloud because then the rhythm the ears are engaging also when we read it by the eyes only the eyes pathway are engaging when we see and read it aloud then mouth eyes ears are engaging it's a physical phenomena and it is engaging with that consciousness which is embodied in savitri and this consciousness goes inside it will enter into brain centers which is the master center and from there it will work upon the entire through the nervous system upon the body then when we write we are engaging also the hand and the nervous system which you know um, governs locomotion and then yes if we work with our hands and feet every day if one hour we can find time to work impersonally for the divine and it could be very simple work in ashram we see many people just making blessing packets or a crochet work some work one hour that this is a work i'll do for the sake of the divine it's not like somebody else will appoint us for this work it could be a self appointed work that okay let me write if nothing else let me write and i'm doing it as my offering to the divine mother or let me walk around and walk around as the offering of my body to the divine mother even that is a work so divine working for the divine doesn't mean that um, it's a special work given in the ashram of course all work in the ashram is the mothers that's one part but even otherwise all the works we are engaged in if we can do it as a prayer then as she says is the body's best prayer to the divine work is body's best prayer to the divine so if we adopt this kind of lifestyle or these kind of changes in our attitude approach and way of life then the day would not be far when at least a sizable number of humanity will be ready to pass beyond the law of death this is the path people had undertaken and now when i use the word beyond the law of death i am speaking of the physical body it is the going to be the last conquest maybe a thousand years because the physical body is the most obscure part the most rigid part shurbindo did not even promise it he said well physical uh, conquest over physical death is the last penultimate crown of the yoga it is there in the program so if you see the to do list it's there but he himself said that a thousand years the mother made it shorter by the yoga of the cells so when people ask oh where is that physical body they have not understood what really shurbindo speaks about every other part must engage in yoga union with the divine let us become conscious of our immortality and shed this fear of death this sting of death let us become conscious of other domains of existence and thereby continue to consciously live in those domains even after physical withdrawal let us integrate our entire life around the psychic being and therefore become a conscious soul individuality a true spiritual person or a divine person acting in this world and the more such people grow up on this world the more possibility that one day we'll have the physical immortality not one day we will have we, we are going to have it but we can make the whole passage shorter will it be for all no certainly not it's uh, you know it's a process it's a long way it won't be automatically that people will wake up and because the super mind is there they'll become immortal it will be absurd to believe it it's an evolutionary process and those who engage with it today tomorrow yesterday they will have to go through that process and after a process evolution is not like all the apes woke up and one day and they became man and <laughs> human beings and started writing poetry no there were apes who were curious who were uh, 
touched with the sense of the apehood and its limitations. So too with human beings. If we are too satisfied with life as it is, we can forget about evolution. We can either had comfort and safety of present life, or we can engage with evolutionary process, which means leaving behind the comfort zones and engaging with the new and the unknown. This urge, this thirst for the new and the unknown is what makes us young. So one of the things which, will, which prevents aging is this thirst for progress. But unfortunately, what happens by the time we are 25, 30, especially if we have a university degree, we have the illusion that we know. It is one of the most dangerous diseases with which humanity suffers. That, okay, now I'm an MD psychiatry, I know it all. It should be the beginning of knowledge that I really don't know. I have read so much. At least that was my impression. Going through the entire MBBS and MD curriculum, I realized, oh my God, I know nothing. So what if you get a gold medal? You don't understand anything about anything. So when there is this urge for progress, we remain young. That's why the mother gave a very nice formula. Uh, remain young. Never stop striving towards the future. Even when our body cannot move an inch, something within us can strive towards the future. At least in consciousness, we can aspire. And it is that which makes a person truly young. And if there are more and more young people in the world like that, as she said, there are 20 years, uh, people who are 20 years, but already old. The sign of old age is when people start speaking about what they were doing when they were young. And they very nicely conceal all their naughtinesses. They only say, oh, I did this, I did big things. But they forget about all the steps and the errors they made. And the sign of young is that even at 80, they're looking forward towards the future. So even those who are on deathbed, so-called deathbed, my advice is, which I tell people, conceive a beautiful future. Oh, how can we conceive? We don't have a future. Of course, you have a future. If not this life, there is their lives to come. There are bodies that are being formed. You can start forming your body right when you are in this very body, that you want a healthier body, you want a more beautiful life. So this is how one should uh, keep striving toward the future and never stop growing. One day the body will catch this fire and grow into the ways of the spirit. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you, Alokji. Um, as always, um, it has always been a pleasure and joy to listen uh, the understanding from you, uh, the writings of the Mother and Shirovindo. Uh, today, as obviously, we are talking about freedom from death. And one thing which at least was very clear to me that whenever we talk about immortality, we think about some magic, whereas it's a process. And in so many words, you have explained that that is not a magic. It's not going to happen next morning. There is a process and whoever participates will get there eventually. Uh, so if anyone has any question, please um, you can ask. Or you can type and I can ask however you like. Lalit Bhai has his hand up? Or? No, it's, it's, uh, it's old. Sorry. Sorry. It seems like a minute. I, I do have a question. Thank you so much, Dialog. This is Dolores. Uh, Mother Hi. left us an amazing uh, mantra, which is Om Namo Bhagavate. And I think she explained really well the significance of that. And I think, as you mentioned about this path of changing and faith, and um, as you mentioned, it's like a programming ourselves to the future. And uh, if we live with this faith, we'll continue. So, but we going through the days, as you mentioned, like an ego personality that we woke up in the morning with amazing aspiration. And as we're going down the day, everything goes down. So how to keep up with this aspiration vivid in every single moment to develop this sincerity towards the divine and continue with this consciousness in every single moment. So thank you, Dolores, first of all, for bringing in this element of the mantra. 
and uh, mantra has a very direct impact upon the body so i did speak about savitri but you know mantra because one mantra tunes our entire being to the rhythms of the higher nature right now we don't have these rhythms available easily within the human system all around is noises and voices clamoring to be heard <laughs> so <laughs> you know mantra is something which it's like a retuning of the body and mind and of course heart to the higher scale to the higher order higher rhythm and even normal music to an extent does help but still the mu normal music has certain limitations mantras can take us much higher and uh, you know every day to spend some time either listening to the mantra preferably chanting the mantra is one of the wonderful ways to impact the body consciousness and all others uh, you know to wake up to that uh, higher possibility so thank you for mentioning that yes uh, as you know with regard to the fluctuations of consciousness uh, it's it takes a long time long time simply because it's not something natural because naturally our body and mind you know nature has drawn a magic circle around us and doesn't want us to go beyond it pulls us back again and again into the ego center so one of the things which becomes very easy or rather two things one way which is more psychophysical uh, and deeply spiritual and the other which is you know uh, more philosophical as well as psychological so the philosophical and psychological way is to keep orienting to the goal so once one keeps orienting to the goal it's a way which uh, i have found very easy for me to navigate through so when there is a thing to be done and there is a choice between different modes of the ego then uh, i end up seeing that well how is it going to impact upon my goal and ultimately everything can be turned towards the goal that is a very interesting part it's not like either or and when we start looking at life this way that you know i have a goal and how this particular thing helps me to go towards the goal and i am assuming here of course the goal as you know uh, not just the spiritual evolution but the path that mother and should be they have shown to us so we can look at that and keep on orienting so after some time the ego self tends to give in at it becomes very weak at least the second is that the more we discover the soul the ego self it, it doesn't vanish with the discovery of the soul but it becomes very very weak very weak so it's uh, you know it can be easily brushed aside uh, it, it will be there but as a very thin kind of personality as shri ramakrishna would say you know uh, you can hiss but you cannot bite you are defanged like that and the third is of course the way to get rid of the ego finally is the awakening to the spiritual self which means to keep on persistently uh, concentrating above the head and to you know think about that peace vast ocean of consciousness one can imagine a light which is beyond and slowly a time comes when our consciousness starts getting merged into it identified it with it and then the ego self vanishes completely because we have discovered the new identity of being a child of the divine mother having said that the second way which is again uh, very simple and very beautiful is just to remember the mother and offer her and to call her name calling her name uh, you know when uh, in the very beginning uh, turning towards yoga a very elderly person who was very erudite excellent he had knowledge of practically uh, every possible scripture and a very brilliant person very good speaker chotnarayan sharma i don't know whether some of you have heard him or not and uh, you know while uh, we were just taking a walk and he was extremely intuitive person so he told me you know somebody asked me uh, pro probably this was his way of you know uh, tuning us so he said you know when somebody asked me that i have this problem that problem and you know my ego comes dashes and i suffer this misery so um, i just told him that you take mother's name so he was uh, very happily like a child recounting that how magically within 6 months it all vanished but he did it very sincerely so uh, actually if you ask me it is sounds very strange but just calling the mother keeps the consciousness oriented towards the mother and where mother is there i cannot be i mean Uh, it's it's a very well known ancient truth uh, when hari is there then 
the, the ego self is not there. So to keep calling the divine in every circumstance is such a joy that is given to human beings. I think it's the greatest joy that is given to us to be able to call the divine. And if we can get it into our system, even if we are not able to feel it all the time, at least mechanically we can remember. Well, otherwise, sincerity is very difficult because the mind will play 100 tricks. It can even give us very beautiful justifications for greatest insincerity as if it is the most sincere thing to do. But when we call mother's name and go through life, how the things will just stay away out of the range. And whatever comes because it will be touched by that fire will automatically undergo a purification. So I think... Uh, uh, otherwise, of course, the ways, the technical ways to look at every moment and see how it is helping me to go toward the goal, to try to integrate it in the light of the soul. But that requires a certain degree of, uh, you know, inner psychological development. It's not easily accessible. But the one method is mother's name and calling mother's name with everything. And this is the last document she gives toward the end also. She said, let thy will be done, let thy will be done, calling me. This is the main way of, you know, mainstay of yoga, of sadhana, of life. So I suppose that it should be the way. Then she will begin to show whatever is insincere will begin to show up spontaneously by a kind of intuitive knowledge, not by a kind of mental knowledge because mind can deceive. So let intuition awaken and calling mother's name inwardly is one of the fastest way towards it. Yes. Thank you, Alanda. Uh, yes. There is another question uh, from Vaishali. Vaishali, do you want to ask or do you want me to ask the question? Okay, let me ask the question. So the question is, what would be a sincere prayer when you see your loved one's leaving body? Okay, what would be a sincere prayer when you see your loved one leaving a body? If you ask me the one prayer under all circumstances, after every possible prayer, experimentation, reading, practicing, I can say is let thy will be done. There is no other higher prayer than that. But otherwise, the most practical prayer is to say the person first of all, that you go further. We are fine. We are okay. Sometimes it's necessary to whisper into the ears of the one who is departing. Tell them, don't be tied to the body and to us. We'll manage it. We are okay. You go ahead on your journey. It's a big relief to travel without these baggages. And second is to send authentic love and peace and prayer that may the transit be smooth. It, we don't need to go into all this complicated shrath and all these processes. Just to simply send thoughts of love. Ma, be the one who is going on the journey. Take care of the person. Take the person in your fold. Protection and grace. Even one can image that person's image, which is there in the mind. Uh, one doesn't need, you know, a physical form. And keep offering it to the mother. Or if there is a photograph, keep it with mother's picture and keep it at the altar and leave it at that. These are very simple, practical ways of a good farewell sent off. And uh, yes, as I said, the highest prayer under all circumstances, because we really don't know, is let thy will be done. So let thy will in all encompassing. After all, the divine will is the highest will. And, you know, it will take the person through the most rapid and beautiful way toward the higher evolution, which is ultimately the goal of the journey. So let thy will be done continues even beyond a body's life and in the next life because this is the prayer with which we have sent the person surrounded by this prayer and the presence. But best, uh, simplest is to send thoughts of love, not to grieve. If grief comes to remember that he's on a transit. After all, the person is going ahead. It's a future word movement. There should not be any unhappiness when somebody is going toward the future. And as the scriptures tell us, this future is always better than this future, this life. It is always an improvement. It's not like somebody will become a rat or a you know a lizard or things like that. So it's something beautiful for the person. So when we really love that person, the final act of love is to set the person free. And if one can set the person free while in life, nothing like it. If there are grudges, if there are attachments, tell the person that, look here, you are a free person. Go on your onward journey. Meet new people, new beings. Look forward to it. And may you realize the purpose of your life as you 
move forward. But free the person from ourselves. That's very important. Otherwise, people carry a lot of baggage. It's good to whisper into their ears. I did it when my physical mother was passing. I said, Ma, you carry on. Don't worry about us. And everything will be okay. You are with the mother. Literally kept my hand over her head. And she passed away in that way. Not to tie them back. Not to be, you know, after all, grief for what? It's a transit which is towards the future. So why grieve for something which is going to be better? Yes, we are attached, therefore grief come because we will miss or lose that person. But let's keep that person in sweet memories, in beautiful memories. It's not always possible to be physically with a person. But we can learn to keep the person in a beautiful corner within us, in sweet and beautiful memories, and then release him into the domains of the spirit. Thank you, Alakji. Uh, just one question is coming to my mind as a Follow up. Yes. To uh, we always are saying Atma ki shanti ke liye prarthna kar rahe or peace of the soul. Atma is already such the anantra. Whose peace are we praying for? Oh, yeah. It's like saying wicked souls. There are no wicked souls. There are all beautiful souls. But I suppose, yeah, this that's one of the things which often strikes uh, as an anomaly. <laughs> uh, see, well, the soul is always of the nature of peace. Because it's a portion of such not only peace of joy, uh, because it's a drop of the pure consciousness, but it's entangled in the vital mesh. That is the whole thing. That it has forgotten itself and is experiencing life and world through this mesh which is sticking around it. So when it is said Atma ki Shanti, what it means is that get rid of all these distortions and you know cobwebs which are surrounding so that you discover your own true nature which is of the nature of peace. But yes, it sounds very strange Atma ki Shanti and you know uh, but technically it means that the vital sheath which is the cause of pain, suffering and grief and all that may this fall off from you. So then you discover your own true nature which is of the nature of peace. We could equally say that, O oh soul, arise and awake, know yourself. As good as saying, Atma ki Shanti. We could in fact, standing by the side of the dead, say, be on your beautiful journey, O oh resplendent one. Arise, be not tied to this mortal coil. Be not tied to us. Be not tied to all these kind of vital um, you know, links that you had formed in which you were entangled. This is the time for freedom. Be free. Be eternal, be true, be beautiful, that which you already are. This could be a prayer. I mean, so many. Thank yeah. you. Uh, I think uh, this, what you just said, it was another question, but I could, I take it that maybe answer to the question. The question was, please give us a message today on Sri Aurobindo's Mahasamadhi Day. One, one word, one, one sentence, death does not exist. Let's stop believing in the reality of the unreal. Death is one of the biggest tricks which the senses in collusion with the forces of darkness plays upon us. It puts a dark curtain and the senses, when we live in the senses, death is so real, the only real thing. We have to stop believing in death. What happens is the body disintegrates and let's find ways and means to Prevent this disintegration. That's all right. But death doesn't exist. I continues to exist. Existence continues in other ways, modes of being. So the one single thing to remember today is that, well, death doesn't exist. Which means to say that Sri withdrew, he's no more, he departed, are the language of perfect ignorance which we have mastered. Let us now master the language of the uh, language of the of knowledge and let us gather the wisdom of the infinite death doesn't exist Shurabindo did not die or depart or anything like that he simply changed his mode of being and way of being and he can show himself to those who love him in ways and means which are beyond our uh, physical frame thank you thank you uh, Thank you. I think looks Thank like you. all the questions are done here and uh, oh, Pramita has a question. Pramita has a hand. Yes. Yes. Yes, Govind. Pramita, Pramita has a question. Pramita, you have a question? Yes, Pramita. Yes, Namaste Da. 
Namaste, namaste, Pramida. Tell me, please. Yeah. The, what should be an attitude of a married young man with kids diagnosed with stage three or four cancer? See, one attitude, as you said, we can always say, "Thy will be done." But there could, there also could be one more way of saying, "I want to live. I want to be with the family, or you know, I want to pursue this life or whatnot." What should be the attitude? Attitude should be based on sincerity. If one wants to live, that's why I said highest prayer is let thy will be done. But not that everybody can say it. So the highest in such a case, there should always be the will to live, but not just for family, but to fulfill the purpose for which one comes upon earth. So the will should be that I want to live and offer this will to the Lord and the divine. And most importantly, now stage three, terminal, everything is there, but still there is life. And how I can compress my fifty years of existence into three months—that is the whole trick and art of living. I know a person, one lady, who actually had stage four ovarian cancer, and the last six months of her life, she turned towards Mother and Shivindo, traveled to Pondicherry. had the feeling of home coming started reading savitri for the next 4 months she was so much immersed in it that when she had left the body before that she used to experience when she would read savitri like magical blue lines coming around and she told me i can't tell this experience to anybody nobody will believe it before dying she, her face was turned to the mother uh, there was a calendar which she had wanted to put she was uh, smiling when her pulse and blood pressure were not recordable so doctors couldn't believe what they are seeing or witnessing so the progress one makes at the time of death is tremendous 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 let that opportunity not be lost in always lamenting grieving or holding on in ignorant ways let's use if i have one day i often ask this question if i had one day to live one thing to do what will i do will i want to spend time with family maybe but i would like to put that one day entirely dedicated to remembrance of the divine because that is something which i'll carry all my life and this is what i would advise to anybody if you know you have one day one moment one hour put yourself into the divine but unfortunately what happens is if all our life we have not lived like that it becomes difficult that's why the gita says live your life as if in remembrance of the divine so that when the moment of departure comes you will happily plunge there will be no fear but unfortunately we don't live our life like that then becomes a problem last minute but still terminal means there are still some time left while one goes through whatever is required medically and otherwise i am not getting into that but take it that now when the clock is ticking time is ticking let's invoke the timeless when kal is calling us let us call mahakal you know that the story of markandeya so that's how i would take it that take this as an opportunity to jump time because moment of death is a intense moment and in all intense moment the consciousness is very concentrated we don't have to try anything special because we have a option either to concentrate on death or the eternal and let's concentrate on the eternal in whatever way whatever form And thank you all i would advise yeah sorry thank you alok ji i think uh, there is a the story of parichit also is pretty yes. similar to the same and how mahabhagwat came into existence as because of that uh, there is another question from burni uh, how do we know when we are in contact with our soul oh that's a big <laughs> question i have dealt with in several places but few quick touches upon it how do we know when we are in contact with the soul as i said first is the spontaneous sense of immortality the certitude of immortality and the entire fear of death vanishes with it it's something like that second there is a reversal of consciousness all the values change what seemed so important becomes so unimportant and what seems vague and indistinct becomes so important as if it's our very life and our breath so that is the second divine becomes a reality of our existence we can't conceive of life living without the divine these are the signs of touching the soul bhakti surrender faith they become so natural 
the urge to serve the urge for progress compassion gratitude they awaken within like beautiful flowers in the garden of the soul because that is the nature of the soul we spontaneously feel love of the divine because that's how the soul recognizes the divine and the divine mother so these are spontaneous inbuilt knowledge of the soul the intuition begins to flow from the heart through the heart because all knowledge is engraved and embedded in the soul all seed of divine knowledge it blossoms and whatever direction or whatever element we want to know that truth begins to awaken then we begin to discern spontaneously between what is true and false and if you go over a period of time you will see that yes your discernment was right not by any mental processes but by a direct spontaneous intuitive discernment as should be the says one glance separated the true from the false this is one of the first signs of the awakening to the soul one becomes conscious that the very purpose of life and the aim for which one is born one becomes conscious of the mission and uh, of course the nature of the soul is self existent peace bliss and love and of course wisdom so when we awaken in the soul then these things become very natural or native to us there is a state of inner peace that we experience and if we don't project ourselves outside it becomes our <coughs> inbuilt nature the self existent joy and most important love which is soul is made of the stuff of love and gratitude toward the divine compassion uh, enthusiasm for the divine work urge to do the divine work to live one's life for the divine service all these to say the least are signs of the contact and you know merger with the soul there are things more than this of which no human tongue can utter our relationship with the divine changes into a beautiful sweet intimacy it's no more something vague or someone vague out there up there he becomes so intimate the very stuff of our breath we breathe divinity so how can one describe those wonderful things yeah Thank we you. we are not afraid of death and we can discover even our past lives that's one of the side as we come closer to the soul we have a spontaneous awakening to some of those moments flashes in the past life uh, which were crucial or critical which have led us to this point thank you thank you alok ji i think uh, thank you for staying longer than what you could have no, no, it's okay it's thank you thank you alok ji thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. and if i may may just take one yeah. 30 seconds to uh, yes. uh, something not more than we'll just quickly uh, do this there is my computer screen so can you see my screen i'm not sure so yeah. as so as you may know uh, we have uh, started this uh, one day matram project uh, an untold story and with the mother's grace uh, today we have signed the contract uh, what it really means that uh, the work is starting today so dr chandra prakash devedi ji's team uh, wisdom tree production is going to start working on the what we call a story book so just wanted everybody to know and thank you for everyone for providing your uh, support a lot of many of you have already provided support and obviously we continue to get the support so uh, you can go to our website safenada.org and there is way to contribute towards this project so whenever you have a chance uh, please uh, do that and we will continue to update you on the regular basis what's going on there thank you everyone thank you thank you thank, thank, thank you. you namaste thank you namaste Namaste. Thank you very much. Thank Namaste. you. Namaste. 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 Nam